Hi, happy Wednesday, happy CEO check-in. It's great to see you again and have you here. I am excited for my guest today, Dory Clark. She'll be joining us in a few minutes. Some of you may have read one of her books. She wrote Stand Out, she wrote Entrepreneurial You, she wrote Reinventing You. She's a friend, she's super smart, she's funny, and just we're gonna have a great show today. So very excited for that. But you know, I always like to give my go big tip. So, uh, oh, hi, Pauline. Hi, Oliviera. Hi, Running Mirror. Hey, Dory. I'm going to bring you on in a second. So, my go big tip today is to invest in your personal brand. When you're building a business, it can be tempting to just invest in the company's brand. But you're the founder, you're the thought leader. And when you invest in your own personal brand, it helps the company and it helps your entire career. You'll hear from Dory and me soon that we each had several careers. I'm on career number four. I think Dory's on four or five. I'm not sure. We're going to find out. But you're able to make those transitions so much more easily if you've invested in your personal brand. And that might look like making sure you post to social media, creating thought leadership pieces. Um, I call it thought leadership. Dory calls it being a recognized expert. We're going to learn more about that today. It's making sure that when you Google yourself, you like what comes up, and if you don't, that you get that fixed, or you start working on writing more blog posts or doing more social media posting, so that when you Google your name, you love what comes up, and you could imagine that if you were a future client or someone looking for a speaker, that whatever comes up would make that person want to reach out to you. All right, so that's our tip for today, and without further ado, I wanna bring on Dory. It's actually very topical in terms of investing in your personal brand because Dory has built an amazing personal brand for herself and has helped thousands and probably by now millions of other people do the same. So let's see, Dory, we're gonna bring you on now. Here we go. And welcome to CEO Check-In. Today our guest is Dory Clark. And uh, while you're coming on, quick reminder that Million Dollar Women Masterclass is enrolling now. Hey, welcome. Let me just finish that thought. So uh, go to scalewithjulia.com if you are looking for ways to grow your product or services business. Dory, welcome. Julia, I'm so glad to, to be here. Hey. Me too. I've had so much fun the last 24 hours taking this like deep dive into your world because even though we've been friends for five or six years now, knowing you were coming on my show, I was like, I want to know everything about Dory. So I've been like <laughs> in, in Dory binging mode for like 24 hours. And I have to say, it's been so fun. I pulled my copy of Reinventing You off the shelf. I watched some of your lives on Newsweek. You know, I love reading your newsletters. I never, ever miss your newsletters letters because they're so well written. I got to review some of those. So just first of all, thank you for all you put out into the world to help entrepreneurs grow and thrive. I just want to say a big thank you. I've learned so much from you and I know women in our community have too. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm honored. Well, it's great to have you here. One thing I noticed when I was going through all the things you've done is that, you know, you, we all know about you that you walk the walk and talk the talk, right? So in your books, you get very vulnerable. You talk about times, well, I was fired and I had to reinvent myself or, you know, the candidate I was working for, he didn't get elected. So <laughs> I had to reinvent myself. And that's one of the things that, you know, I love about you. And I'm sure everyone who reads your books loves about you is that you share the real stuff and then give very practical tips about how to get over it. So I think you're on maybe career number four or five. Maybe you could just back up and, and let us know how did you become Dory Clark because you and I share some of those careers right we were both documentary filmmakers we're both teachers we both worked at a nonprofit, right and then the theology thing I didn't quite follow you on you're on your own there <laughs> <laughs> that's right well yeah thank you so much Julia so yes I um I my my, fir my first sort of uh career misfire I guess you could say is that I wanted to be a professor that was what I really thought I would do and I got a master's degree and then it turns out I didn't get into any of the uh, doctoral programs that I applied for so they're I, lost <laughs> they're kidding yeah, themselves that's now. Right. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so I had to come up with something different so I I became a, a journalist uh, I was a political journalist for a while got laid off from that uh, worked on a couple of political campaigns as a spokesperson. And as you mentioned, unfortunately, those didn't work either. Uh, I ran a bicycling advocacy nonprofit for a couple of years, and it was actually running that organization that taught me essentially how to run a business, although at the time I didn't really conceptualize it that way. 
And uh, so from there, I have been self-employed and had my own consulting, speaking, writing, coaching, et cetera, business for now. I am coming into year 15. Wow, amazing. Well, that makes me feel better because when I read your emails, I'm always like, she's so buttoned up, man. I got to get this buttoned up, but I'm only on year five, so I feel better now. <laughs> But I did want to say that, you know, you uh, speak and I've heard some of your keynotes, which were fantastic, like at the National Speakers Association. Remember that one a few years ago, back when you could be in front of a room. I, we hope you can get back there soon. But I remember you were talking about multiple revenue streams and you have multiple revenue streams. What you teach. There we go. Entrepreneurial You teaches that. So go out and buy that if you haven't already, if you're listening and watching. But I want to start with that because here we are in this pandemic where so many small business owners, you know, the livelihood, their, their core customers went away for some of them, right? If you were in entertainment, if you were in restaurants, if you were in travel, and people had to reinvent. And those who had multiple revenue streams just did better than others. So talk to us a little bit about that and what you're seeing during the pandemic is helping small business owners in terms of this multiple revenue streams. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, multiple revenue streams are so critical. Like, you know, they're critical in good times, of course, because if you have more opportunity to capture the share of the customer's wallet, then that's, of course, a good thing. It's always easier, as we know, uh, to do business, you know, to do more business with people that you're already doing business with. Uh, because they trust you, they like you, et cetera. But in bad times, having multiple revenue streams becomes incredibly essential because, you know, as we saw with the pandemic, even very quickly and unexpectedly, uh, things that have been traditional, reliable revenue sources can just get, get you know, cut off. I mean, who thought that like, oh, you, you're not going to be allowed to be inside a restaurant. I mean, that has never happened before for 100 years. And all of a sudden that becomes a thing. So having the systems in place to be able to pivot quickly uh, becomes really important. It's not that you have to necessarily master a bunch of revenue streams, but to take the time, you know, kind of a 20% time to invest, to learn, to experiment is great because it enables you to have done the legwork so that you can move quickly if you need to. And just one example, Julia, is in my own business, you know, you were mentioning a couple of years ago when I keynoted for the National Speakers Association Conference, I was giving... Uh, you know, on average, about 40 or 50 talks a year. Um, I actually, in 2015, I went up to 74 talks. That was too many. Uh, so <laughs> That's a lot of travel. <laughs> it was a lot of travel, but I was doing a lot nonetheless. And anyway, it was a big part of my income, uh, which, of course, also unexpectedly during COVID, that got cut off because nobody's having the conferences. They're all canceled. And uh, what turned out to be the saving grace there was that since 2014, I had been experimenting in various ways with online courses. And that was not intended to be a, you know, a panacea for a pandemic. Obviously, I didn't predict that. But what I could predict was, you know what, I might get sick of traveling so much. And nonetheless, uh, the preparation- Maybe I want to do I something that I can do in my slippers. Well, that's right. That with my cats, right? <laughs> yes. yes. So the preparation I, I did for that was it turned out to be transferable in the pandemic. And similarly, I think a lot of small business owners, you know, we've got to think about the different uh, the different ways that these things can manifest. And so you've seen a lot of people pivot pretty successfully. I mean, obviously there's things like delivery, but I mean, you know, there's meal subscription services and you know CSAs and a, a variety of pretty innovative strategies that people are using. Yes, and just to sum that up for people who are new to this concept of multiple revenue streams, it really means just dipping your toe into several different things that can bring in revenues because you never know when you'll need to ramp one of them up, right? I mean, similar to you, Dory, when the pandemic hit and everything went into lockdown, you know, a lot of our revenue just went away, like immediately, poof, overnight. And I remember having a phone call with Elaine Pofeld, who's a friend who wrote the Million Dollar one person business. And she was saying, Oh, yeah, I learned this lesson in 9 11. Because, of course, we're old enough to have lived through 9 11. And she was like, In 9 11, what got me through was multiple revenue streams. And so I've never stopped that. And she and I, you know, kind of bonded over that. So it's exactly what you're talking about. They don't all have to be making the same amount of money. But, like, actually, maybe you could tell us what are your revenue streams? I think people would be curious. Like, how have you done it? What are yours? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, the ways that I earn money now, I do uh, executive coaching, I do uh, consulting, which the distinction that I draw is that executive coaching is for an individual, whereas 
uh, consulting is kind of broader for an organization. Yeah, you work uh, with I, Google and Taco Bell and, and some really big companies, right? I remember just seeing that on your site. Yeah, yeah. I, I feel fortunate. I've gotten to work with a lot of pretty cool companies. Uh, obviously, you get some money, not a ton of money, but you get some money for writing books. Uh, so that's good. Typically, it's a little bit more of a marketing thing, but it does bring in some money. Uh, I make a, a substantial share of my income now from online courses. Uh, some of them I do with other partners like LinkedIn Learning. I do a lot with, there's a company called Exec Online. I have a creative live course, uh, but I also have my own uh, courses that I run. So actually you were alluding earlier to my recognized expert course, which I'm just getting yes. ready to, to relaunch. I'm so next. excited to talk about that next. And what about yes. your Newsweek show? Is that like a revenue source or is that more just more exposure, your Newsweek they, lives? They do, they do pay me for it, yes. So it's- That's it, great. It, certainly it's a, good, it's a good way to to meet people and to connect, but it also is a revenue stream. So yeah, there's uh, sponsorships. You know, sometimes companies will pay me to do blog posts or promotions or things, uh, things like that. I also run an annual mastermind. So it's a one year long mastermind with a, a group of people that I meet with throughout the year. Uh, during uh, happier times when you can meet in person, I will do uh, weekend long workshops that people sign up for. And so that's another uh, revenue stream. So there's, uh, there's a pretty good variety. Yes. Well, like I said, you, you talk the talk and walk the walk about the multiple revenue streams. That's a lot of things. But also back to the books, we have a lot of women who are saying, well, should I write a book? Is that a good use of my time? And even though, yeah, it's not a huge money maker to write the book. In fact, if you add up all the hours you spend writing it, right? Like really, <laughs> it's a money loser, but it, it creates a platform. I mean, you have three books, right? That makes you a recognizable expert and people want to hire you to help them with things. So let's, let's move into that. How did you decide to create an online course around becoming a recognizable expert. And what is a recognizable expert? <laughs> yes, yes, thank you. Well, I, I will say too, I mean, books, books are a, a, a great thing to do. I mean, it's partly, I think for many of us, it's just sort of a life goal, like, hey, wouldn't it be cool to do it? Which frankly, I think is a good enough reason in many cases to do something. Um, but, but yes, you make money from books assuming you are a, a business author, if that's the frame that we're talking about, you make money on the back end. Um, so you make a little bit from, from selling copies of the book, but really it is a way to demonstrate your expertise. And so, you know, people will read my books and I, I forgot another revenue stream. You know, th there is to a certain extent, the in-person keynotes that I used to do, they've been converted to online programs and trainings and webinars and things like yes, that. Yes, and I've so, heard people are paying for that now. In the beginning, it might've been like, oh, we're not paying, but now that we've been on lockdown for so long, I, I doubt yes. they're paying the same amount though, right? As when you fly in and give a keynote, I would think. Yeah, I've, I've cut my rates in half to do it. Okay, virtually. that makes sense. That's what I'm hearing out there. Yeah, yeah and speaking which, of books, feels... thank you so much for endorsing my new book, Go Big Now. I was very honored and thrilled to have you associated. And in my book, I say to anyone who hasn't figured out what they want to do next, because the book is a lot about reinventing, should definitely read, I want to give it another shout out, Reinventing You, your, your book from 2014, before you wrote Entrepreneur of You, right? Which was 2017. Yeah, I See, I, I did my homework. Here. I did my homework. There it is. <laughs> oh, yes, yes I've reread my copy many times because it has all those great tips in it. Hello, kitty cat. Um, it has all those great tips in it, right? Like you could just read, just reading the tips part gives so much value. So if you don't have that book, run out and buy it. And if you're trying to figure out the multiple revenue streams, by Entrepreneurial You. Okay, so what is a recognizable expert? Because we talk about thought leadership a lot in my community. Is that the same or is it different? Yeah, I mean, it's it's similar in, in, in many ways. It's interesting. I actually did a, uh, a podcast for the Harvard Business Review. Oh, we get another guest star. Hi. Yeah, I, okay. It's because I said I love your cats. I always love seeing them on Instagram. And yeah. They, they, they're like, okay, you love me? We're coming in the show. Yeah, he says, actually, I have a, I have a lot to add to this conversation. So. Uh. Well, you know what? I remember when you adopted them, remember? You, would, you were like on your way to get them and they, and they were so little and cute and yeah. They're, they're great kitties. <laughs> yes, now now they're now they're enormous and cute. They're big, as I've seen on Instagram. Yeah, <laughs> they're growing up. Yeah, I've got the teenage boys, and you've got the teenage kitties. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So anyway, um, so yeah, I was just saying I did a uh, a podcast interview a, a few years back. If anyone's interested in sort of diving into the minutiae of the archives, they can do this. But it was for Harvard Business Review. They have a podcast called the HBR Idea Cast, and I did a conversation with them at the time. Um, about the concept of thought leadership. Uh, and it, it was funny as the premise was, is... Oh, 
we had a little pause the there. That it is not gross. Uh, I was uh, I was arguing in favor of thought leadership uh, because the tr the truth is um, it can sound pretentious. I mean, specifically if someone's like. I'm a thought leader. It's like, well, yeah, of course. You sound like a dick. You know, like, right. you know if you have to say it, then maybe you're not. It's something other people should say about you. <laughs> exactly. And so I, I argued that we are on the same page, Julia. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, I think I think that thought leadership is actually something that is good and is good to aspire to. Because, I mean, basically what it implies, if you break it down, is in order to be a thought leader, number one, you are known for your thoughts, right? It's not about being some kind of a celebrity or whatever. You're known for your intellect, which is a good thing. And the second thing is to be a thought leader you you have to have followers like you have to have enough people that are like yeah this actually does make sense this actually is good so both of those things to me are pretty merit based um so yeah. i support thought leadership but yeah and they hey just to make that practical a minute for our listeners you know it doesn't mean that you have to first be you know a three times published author like dory clark is right you can just start putting your wisdom out there like rabia shafi who's on this call who's in our community and as a coach, she works with executives in corporate America. She just started doing LinkedIn Lives with tips for leaders during these troubling times. And that led to a bunch of new business because they were like, oh, you clearly have these things figured out. We should hire you to, to come in, right? So you can create your own thought leadership. And I have a feeling you're gonna take us there with your recognizable expert course. Yes, absolutely. And so the, the premise behind the course really, um, you know, it's, it's called Recognized Expert. Uh, folks can uh, check it out at doryclark.com slash rex, R-E-X, if you'd like to learn more about it. But, you know, the, the basic idea is, you know, I think almost anybody who has become an entrepreneur or self-employed so at a certain point has this like horrifying realization, which is that the minute that you go out on your own, you're like, oh my God, there are so many people doing this same thing. <laughs> Why did I not realize there are so many people doing this? And it's just like, you know, horrifying. Terrifying, yes. And so, of course, you kind of need an answer for that, right? Because all of a sudden, everybody's like, so, Julia, how are you different? You know, and you're just like, Argh. you know, it's like, you got to figure out how to answer that. And it becomes very stressful. And ultimately, the, the problem is that if you, no matter how good you actually are, if you in the marketplace are not properly differentiated from other people, then folks are gonna tune it out. They're not gonna pay attention. They just don't have the time or the bandwidth. And so one of the most important things that you can do, that anyone can do in terms of building a strong foundation for their career is to actually invest in, in the sort of strategy around how do I get known for my expertise? Because the there is a completely different dynamic if you walk in the room and people already know who you are. You, you don't have to like beg or plead or like, oh, could could you pay me fifty dollars? Oh wait, can I add something to that? Because in my little Dory Clark binge in the last twenty four hours, I reread the part of Reinventing You where you say, you know what? You think other people are following what you're doing in your career, but they're really not, right? I mean, I like I love the quote. Um, you might remember I put this in my book, which is, "When you're 20, you care what everybody thinks about you. When you're 40, you stop caring what everybody thinks about you. And when you're 60, you realize no one was thinking about you at all in the first place." <laughs> totally, totally. Right? Yeah. But, but we, we think everyone's following the ball. Like, oh yeah, now you have a different career. No, nobody's following. You have to really like put it in their face over and over again in a nice way, not in a braggy way, right? But mm -hmm. so tell us more how, how people do that. Because people are reinventing right now. People watching this right now are like, yeah, I used to be in the entertainment business. I used to be in the travel business. And now I'm making masks, right? Or whatever it is that they're doing. <laughs> yeah, ab absolutely, Julia. So ultimately what I said, I've spent literally the past decade studying this question I, because I needed to know for myself, I needed to know for my own business. Um, but then I was very motivated to want to share it with other people because ultimately it's just, it's just so frustrating to be good at what you're, you know, what you're doing and not have people know about it. I mean, it's just like a, a terrible gap that is, uh, I think, really upsetting to people. And, and an so expensive I, gap, right? Because you're not going to yeah. get hired to do that keynote if they're like, well, why should we hire her over this other person, right? Exactly. And so it's really important to address. And so what I have come to discover, and you know, I talk about this in my books, I talk about it you know, very intensively in the Recognize Expert course, is that fundamentally there are three levers. There are three components to becoming a recognized expert in your field. And it sort of touches on some of the points that you raised. So three of them, 
content creation. So meaning somehow you have to share your ideas, right? Because if other people don't know what your ideas are, then they don't know that you're any good. Number two, social proof. What is your credibility? Why should people listen to you? If you can have a few markers of credibility that are easy for people to understand, like if you have affiliations with different brands, oh, well, she used to consult for this big company, or oh, she teaches at this university, or oh, she was quoted in this publication. That makes a big difference in terms of your credibility. And it's not that you have to start at the top, right? You start where you're at. I was talking about this yesterday, like one of the big things that was in my bio like a decade ago was I, I was the Somerville, Massachusetts Small Business of the Year Award winner, you know, like, yeah. <laughs> you know, and it's not the first thing in my bio now, but it was a big deal at the time. And, you know, you, you just go from there. And yeah, I think Google comes ahead of that now on your bio. <laughs> yeah. And the third and last piece is your network, right? Because you need yes. you need supporters, you need people who can help amplify your message and your voice. And I remember when you moved to New York a few years ago and you started hosting these dinners for people just to connect people and you know have everyone get to know each other from all different walks of life. You had authors and business people and I don't know, entertainers, because you're very active creatively too. I know you're writing a musical and that's like a, a whole other side to you that's amazing that we may not have time to get into here now, but I can't wait for Broadway to come back so you can be on it one day. And those dinners really built an incredible network. We all stayed in touch with each other. You were the connector, right? So even just having a dinner, right? Could be building your network. It doesn't have to be like, okay, I'm running an online community for 3000 people. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. I mean, you know, everything that we do starts with activities that are not scalable, right? I mean, um, Paul Graham is one of my famous favorite thinkers in Silicon Valley. And he talks about how do you create, you know, a billion dollar startup? Well, you know, you don't, you don't do it by like, oh, I'm going to just, you know, go out and, and scale from day one. What you do is you do things that don't scale, which enables you to build the groundwork, you know, which is why a classic example is Airbnb, you know, which of course now is, you know, whatever, $50 billion. Literally when they started out, they realized that a pain point was that people who were doing the listings were terrible photographers. And so they made their apartments look like crap. So no one wanted to rent them. So literally the founders themselves went and took photos of Right, the imagine listings. having like Brian Chesky show up at your door with his little, you know, Nikon. Absolutely. <laughs> but they're that's what it was. Yeah, they're clearly not doing it today, but in the beginning to get it going, that's the kind of thing you have to do. So it's, it's, Absolutely. it's small, it's high touch. That's a great example. And, you know, Chris Ye was on this show a couple of weeks ago with his new book, Blitzscaling, which he co-authored with Reid Hoffman. And he was saying that's one of the key things you have to do to scale is do things that are not scalable so that you can work out the kinks, so that you can figure out how should this be done before you go invest in a bunch of developers to build software around it, right? And I'm sure you did that with recognizable experts. I want to bet that you didn't start out that course as like a whole online thing. You probably started teaching in a room or just a few people at a time and then realized, hey, this really works. I can scale it up. Is that, is that true? Is that how it went? It is true. Actually, in, in my most recent book, Entrepreneurial You, I tell the story of it. Um, I did a, uh, a pilot in April of 2016, and it was a 40 person pilot of the course. And, you know, instead of, I mean, now the course there's 50 hours of material, you know, there's like all these like, you know, kind of fancy videos and whatever. The first iteration, the first uh, beta test, it was 40 people who signed up and every week we met on Zoom. That was literally all it was. And, you know, you're, you're upfront about it. You're like, hey, guys, we're going to be meeting every week on Zoom. You know, so you're, you're not like, oh, there's no fancy it. portal. Don't ask me where the portal is. Exactly. <laughs> there's no portal yet. But but it was great because it, it validated the premise that people were interested in it and helped me hone the content. And so then later when I actually did invest the time in like spiffing it up, I knew it was worth spending the time to spiff it up. I love that. And in doing these small test batches, right, you get to hear what people like and what they want more of, right? And then you can do that process over and over again. I mean, I built Million Dollar Women Masterclass, my online program, the exact same way. We had 12 women in the first one. I would say, you know, we put it together with Gmail, Dropbox, Bubblegum, and paper clips. It was like, I don't even know how we held that thing together, but I found out what women needed. And now, you know, we've graduated 300 women. And now I'm doing it again with Go Big Now. I'm sure you're like this with all your new books, right? Like, okay, what do I build from this? And the landscape changes so quickly. So like I'm doing a monthly free workshop to go with my Go Big Now book, not only because it'll be fun, but I'll get to hear, hey, what do people care about? Like I just spent two years writing this book, but 
Should I turn it into an online class? Should I turn it into a 21 day email challenge? Should I turn it into an in-person workshop? Why should you have to figure that out? It's so much better to figure it out with your customers, wouldn't you think? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's such a good point. So tell us what people should be thinking about if they're listening to this going, okay, multiple revenue streams. I hear you, Dory, become a recognizable expert. Yes, yes, yes. But you know, I've got two kids at home who haven't even gone back to school yet. I'm helping them with Zoom. I'm trying to run my small business where, you know, getting clients and customers is harder than ever. I don't know when the end of this pandemic slash recession is. Where should they start? What would be a good thing to start with if you're just a small business owner, you know, with your marketing firm or your law firm or accounting firm? We have a lot of services, businesses and product in our community. What should they start by doing? Yeah, great question, Julia, and I'll answer it in two ways, a sort of general way and a specific way. Uh, a specific way is if, if someone who's listening is like, well, what about for me? How should I do it? I actually have a free resource that is a scored self-assessment that people can take that based on your score gives you suggestions about specific tactics to use and which would be most important for you in terms of our Oh, life. awesome. Where can yeah, they find that, Dory? It's pretty, it's pretty, pretty cool, actually. Uh, it, you, they can get it at doryclark.com slash toolkit. And mm -hmm. it, it's, it's one of the, the things that I've created that I'm most proud of because it's, it's very uh, tactical and actionable. But in general, what I would say is a couple of things. The first, uh, and I talk about this a lot actually in my forthcoming book, which is coming out in September called The Long Game. But you know, ultimately, there, we have to kind of think in waves in terms of our career. And you know, we sort of have to be gentle with ourselves. Like, okay, I mean, if there's a pandemic, it's like, don't beat yourself up if you can't be like, you know, you know, finishing your book or something like that. If you've got kids running around at home, there's time for things. And you have to, there's periods when you over index on certain things and under index on certain things. The key is just not to give up and shelve something for a while. Like just find the small manageable thing that even if the pace is slower, you, you keep it up in some small way. So the, the quick rule of thumb is I would say um, in the early days, if you're sort of just starting thinking about building your recognized expert uh, platform, then like literally do whatever. It kind of doesn't even matter. Like pick content, pick social proof, pick network, do something. because Just start, just start because it can evolve, right? That's right. If you are more advanced in the path, what I would generally say is that we a mistake that we tend to make is continuing to do the thing that we like to do or that we're comfortable doing. And so we do it too much at the exclusion of the other things. So if you're farther along, I'd say look at what you're not doing and then spend and invest the time there. Oh, that's fantastic advice. And also I would add to that to look around at what other competitors are doing. And maybe you can add just one thing to your mix. Like a, a personal example is I always wanted to do a live show like this, but I was sort of afraid of going live. You know, I'm a, I'm a recovering perfectionist. So <laughs> the idea that like things would happen live and I couldn't make them perfect before they were out there, I didn't like that. But during the pandemic, when everything got very quiet, I was like, well, maybe it's time to try out live. And I was super uncomfortable for the first few weeks, but now it's fun and I look forward to it, right? So just like add one thing, maybe the thing that makes you the most nervous. Would that, would that be a good thing to add? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, why not? Absolutely. We can challenge people, right, to do that. Um, I see we have some great people joining us and I wanna make sure I get to answer a couple questions. You've been sharing so much awesome wisdom. Thank you, Dory, I wanna check in the questions and also for all you entrepreneurs who are watching if you're looking for help scaling your business we offer our four-month group coaching program million dollar women Masterclass. just go to scalewithjulia.com and you can find out more there and see if you're a fit we're enrolling right now all right here we go so informa viaggiatrice italiana that was testing my italian there says i'm enrolling for hr summits and conferences here in dubai to start making myself more known in the HR and L&D world. That's a Fair good thing enough. to do, right? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, speaking, I, I deliberately use the phrase, you know, content creation as part of the Recognized Expert Framework because I am platform agnostic. There's a lot of different ways you could do it. It could be writing articles. It could be doing Instagram Lives like this. It could be, you know, starting a podcast. It could also be presenting at conferences. So any of those, like whatever feels good to you, do it. The key is sharing your ideas publicly so that others can see what they are. And I think you said in one of your books, I forget which one in my binge, that don't worry if they don't pay you for it at first right? Because the, you need to get a few under your belt. Sometimes people don't want to do things until they can actually get paid. But no, 
especially in a time like this, just put yourself out there. What, what's your feeling on that? Like, do people have to get paid right away? Yeah, I think, I think that's a really important point. I mean, certainly I spent years, I spent probably, um, I would say about seven years uh, of doing a fair amount of public speaking before I ever got a paid speaking gig. Uh, it's something that you need to think about as part of your marketing mix. Now, uh, but, you know, that doesn't mean that you, you know, sort of do it blindly. You want to do it in ways that are advantageous to you. So yes. um, certainly if you're, if you're, sole goal is just practicing then okay great practice anywhere but if you're already feeling like yeah i'm pretty good at this then be strategic speak in front of audiences of potential buyers who can buy other services for you or speak in front of uh groups where it's actually prestigious to say that you've spoken there if you can yeah. do that then you're getting some value out of it absolutely and you know even the big guys do that and big gals like i've been on clubhouse a lot lately the new social media platform that is all audio right and you know gary vaynerchuk is on there brendan Burchard is on there they're not getting paid to do that but they're figuring okay well if this is a hot new platform i need to be there and i think this circles back to this thought leadership and being a recognizable expert i think that if more people um embraced and i'd be curious what you think of this if you embraced right from the beginning I'm going to be a recognizable expert, right? Then w how would you pursue your career differently? Like, would you put yourself out there on Clubhouse, right? Would you start going live? I think some people think, especially women, because we're socialized this way, like it has to be perfect before we want to go out there. Like, well, later when I have more success or later when I'm bigger, I'll do that. What, what would you say to that, Dory? Yeah, I, I think that's really important, Julia. Um, one of the things that I've really seen with the, the folks that I work with, and, you know, it's a lot of, uh, similarly, you know, service professionals, uh, things like that, that uh, what I would say a mistake is, you know, among, I mean, the people who are not successful are doing neither sales nor marketing. So that's not good. Uh, but <laughs> among people that are successful, but not as successful as they want to be, uh, a mistake that I see is that they focus too exclusively on sales. So meaning, uh, you know, this sort of tactical, like, oh, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to get this business and I'm going to get this referral. And that's wonderful. You have to do that. That's a really important thing to do early in your business so you can get it going. But it's easy to forget marketing. And by marketing, I mean, it's the longer range, longer term activities that build your brand. They don't, you know, writing an article, it's not going to get you a client tomorrow. I mean, you know, maybe if there's a lightning strike, there is, but, but it's, it's a lot less likely to get you a client than like, you know, asking for a referral. But that doesn't mean it's not important to do. It is important to do because it doesn't get you the client tomorrow, but it gets you a really good client five years from now. Absolutely. And, and, you know, I'm sure you've had this experience where someone calls you and says, oh, I heard you on stage, you know, three years ago, or I have your book and I just pulled it back out and thought, now I'm going to call you and get some help. So that's great advice. And I think also when you do your thought leadership consistently and well, then you don't have to sell as hard because people come to you, right? And that's also part of the reason to do thought leadership so that sales can come in more easily. You know, you shared on a recent um, Newsweek Live, I forget, what, what is your show called? Better, right? Is that what it's called? It is, yes. Better, yes. And I highly recommend Better. You interviewed someone who is a social media expert and she talked about these three C's, right? Of um, So let's just share that as a last tip. And then I do want to ask you one long game question because I'm curious since you just wrote a book about that. I want to share a little wisdom. But first, just real practical and tactical, since you and I both love to give people tips they can actually act on right away. Let's see if I got this right. The three C's that everyone should focus on for social media are compact, so little short bites, because people don't have a lot of patience, um, consistent, and you were just talking about that before, write that blog post, you know, go live once a week, whatever it is, consistent, and creative. Get creative with it. Take some risks. Do something that maybe nobody else is doing. Does that, does that sound about right, Dory? This is from your show. <laughs> that was fantastic. Yes, absolutely. And those are tips uh, just to, to, give, uh, to give credit to the originator, uh, Shama Haider, a good friend of mine, the author of uh, yes. The Zen of Social Media Marketing. Uh, those are her three Cs. And she, uh, I think, I think uh, to your point, Julia, it's really spot on in terms of a framework and a way to think about it. Um, yes, so. she was fantastic. All right, so tell us about the long game and then we'll let you go. This is so great to have all this time with you, but I know you take such a deep dive into your topics. You interview people, you give tips, all this stuff. So tell us a little bit what that's, that's about so that when the book comes out in September, we'll, we'll know to go get it. Yeah, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Uh, the book Good. is coming out September 21st uh, from Harvard Business Review Press and it's called The Long Game, How to Be a Long-Term Thinker in a Short-Term World. 
And it's basically about, uh, I would say, uh, so, you know, certainly something that I've experienced, and I think a lot of entrepreneurs uh, have experienced it in one fashion or another, which is, we, on one hand, we know intellectually, every, everyone has heard, everyone can tell you, yes, success does not happen overnight. We are all perfectly cognizant of that. And yet, there is also, you know, at, at the other end, this, you know, sort of whisper in our ear of like, well, how the fuck long is it going to take? You know, like, <laughs> right. It's too long sometimes. <laughs> and, and, and like, is it one article? Is it 10 articles? Is it 100 articles? Is it, is it a thousand? Don't tell me it's a thousand. You know, and is it's it a like, decade? Do I have to wait a decade until anybody knows who I am, right? There is a huge gap. And so it, it's getting through that part. It's understanding how do you conceptualize the arc of success and how do you how do you stand it when it is not happening yet? How do you get through that difficult part so you can get to the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow? That's what that book is about. I love that. I can't wait to read it. It's a great title. Do you also touch on mindset a little bit? You know, since I just wrote my book on mindset, I'm very mindset focused. Do you touch on that a bit in it? I, I do, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's it's so easy for people at various you know, troughs in the process to give up. And of course, you know, that's, that's the irony, right? Is, is like, you know, it's, a, it's like, you know, sort of just one more hill and, and you can do it, but, but you don't know that. And so, you know, it's like, oh, well, you know, how, how many of these hills are there? And so it, it really is a question of how, how do you maintain a, a supple enough mindset that you're able to simultaneously stay motivated and focused for the long term and recognize like, okay, it, it may, it might not, but it may well take longer than I want it to. And I, I'm going to be okay with it. I have to be okay with that. Uh, because that is the only way that we actually get to the success that we want. I love that. And, and that's why I'm so happy you mentioned earlier, like, hey, I've been at this 15 years, right? Someone could look at you and just say, well, how come she has online courses and books and all that? And it's like, you have played the long game and, and you're still like just at the beginning because there's so much more I know that you have to bring to the world. And I'm so excited to be able to follow along and share you with our listeners here on CEO Check-In. So thank you so much for coming. Give the kitties a snuggle for me. People can find you where, if they just tuned in recently, where can they find you, Dory? Thank you so much, Julia. It's such a joy to get to spend time with you. Uh, if folks want to learn learn more about me, get articles, all the stuff, it's doryclark.com. And if you want to get the free recognized expert assessment that we talked about, uh, where it's a scored self-assessment to figure out where you should be spending your time, again, it's doryclark.com slash toolkit. Fantastic. Well, great having this time with you. Have an awesome day and we'll talk soon and hopefully see each other soon. One of these days. <laughs> awesome. Julia, thank you so much. All right. Take, Take care. Bye. Bye. Oh, that was so fun. Dory is awesome. And she also has introduced me to just fantastic people who become friends here in New York City and beyond. And I definitely recommend that you run out and buy that book, uh, Entrepreneurial You, to figure out how to have more diverse revenue streams. That has saved so many small businesses during this pandemic. And she also has her self-assessment, so you can find that. Thank you for all these awesome comments, especially Informa Viaggiatrice Italiana. I get to show off my Italian there. Um, and for tuning in to CEO Check-In. If you are looking to scale your business and you're a small business owner, we only launch our program a couple times a year, Million Dollar Women Masterclass. You can find out more at scalewithjulia.com. In the meanwhile, stay brave and go big. And I will see you here next week on CEO Check-In. Bye.